Hello, this week I created artificial life. At the command prompt, of course. Just look at how complicated and sophisticated this life is. I've got clusters of individuals forming families and groups, fighting for resources and competing for space. They're breeding and multiplying, and occasionally you'll see them sending out a member of the family to go and interact with other clusters. I am, of course, talking about the British mathematician John Conway's Game of Life, which is a class of cellular automata. Now, you might think that a really complicated behaviour like this would take several thousands of lines of code to implement. In fact, it doesn't. It takes about three. And this is why cellular automata are really cool. You can take a very simple rule set, spread it across a hugely parallel processing substrate, and the resulting emergent behaviour can exhibit all sorts of really complicated phenomena. Like several of my other videos, this video will use the OLC console game engine. And you can click the little link above to see more details about that. But essentially all it does is wrap up the command prompt in a display buffer so I can draw to it easily. To use the console game engine, you need to create a class that inherits from it, and overwrite two methods, which are onUserCreate and onUserUpdate. I've called this class the uh, Game of Life. And in our in main function now, all we need to do is create an instance of the class, the Game of Life class, and tell it what dimensions of the console we want. So to start with, I'm going to use 160 characters across by 100 down, and each character is going to be 8 by 8 pixels. I then call the start function, which will then repeatedly call the onUserUpdate function. This algorithm holds a particularly special place in my heart. For as long as there have been computers, there have been people programming John Conway's Game of Life for them. Now, for a number of years, I worked in academia. And I worked in a field where we developed a technology called cellular processor arrays. These were highly parallel processing devices. And to test them, we would always run Game of Life, because if we saw that it could run life, it could probably do all of the other complicated things we needed them to do. I'm not going to go into the history of Game of Life. There's an excellent Wikipedia article that will do just that. And we'll be using this article as a source of inspiration to try out different patterns. The sheer amount of research into Game of Life is vast. Mathematicians love it, computer scientists love it, and people have proven that it's got all sorts of fantastic properties. For example, it's quite possible to set up a pattern where the little critters will move around and implement a fully functional computer. And there are other patterns which can emulate circuits, and people are using it for generating music and, and all sorts of interesting sequences. But fundamentally, the whole phenomena stems from very simple rules, and I mean very simple rules. And this is why it's such an interesting algorithm. How do you get all of this complex, we call it emergent behaviour, out of such a simple rule set? So how do we make cellular automata? Well, the first thing you're going to need is a grid. And in this case, I'm using a two-dimensional grid of squares, where a cell is directly connected to its immediate neighbours. Every cell in the grid executes a program. And all of these programs are identical, but they operate on local data. Each cell contains a memory which can be used to store its current state. And for Game of Life, this is very simple. It's simply on or off. But it could be much more complicated. Each cell has the ability to interact and communicate with its neighbours. And finally, but this is the most important part, all of the cells run a program, but they all run the same program and they all run the same program, synchronised with each other. This gives way to the SIMD paradigm, single instruction, multiple data, where a single instruction is broadcast across the whole processing array, but it uses its local data to operate on. So this SIMD approach, coupled with uh, neighbour communication, gives rise to cellular automata. The program for Game of Life is very simple. Step 1, we count our neighbours. So let's assume I am this cell in the middle here, and I have some alive neighbours, and these are going to be indicated by red dots. We can only talk to the neighbours in our immediate vicinity. So this gives us a 3x3 three three square around the active cell, and we can count how many red dots are in this square. So in this case, it's 3. Now this is where we introduce some very simple rules. Let's consider the rules when the cell is alive, i.e. its output is set to 1, so it's a blue dot or it's a red dot here. If the cell is alive and has less than two neighbours, it dies from loneliness. If it has greater than three neighbours, 
it dies from overcrowding. Otherwise, the cell has a good number of neighbours and it's happy. We'll put a smiley face on. And it stays alive. Now let's consider a dead cell. It's not outputting anything. But in the weird world of John Conway, if a cell has three neighbours and it's dead, those three neighbours get together and produce a living cell. And so in this instance, this cell now becomes active. In fact, so does this one. Because it too also has three active neighbours. And that's it. That really is how simple the rule set is. But there is one more important thing to do. We have to do everything at the same time. We cannot scroll through the cells one by one and update them as necessary. Instead, we have to treat all of the cells as if they're in one epoch of time. As we carry on scrolling through the cells, we can't count the ones that have already been set on this epoch, or else this one would also become alive, and then this one would also become alive, and these are incorrect results. Having seen how simple the rule set is, it's time to do this in code. And I'm going to do this by creating two two-dimensional arrays, one that represents the output and one that represents the current state of the cell. So the output is what basically we'll see on the screen, and the state is the current memory within the cell. In the onUserCreate function, I'm going to now allocate the memory for my two two-dimensional arrays, and I'm going to use the screen width and screen height, so that's the 160 by the 100 characters that we set before. And this means I can choose a console of any size, and life should function appropriately. Just for good practice, I'm then going to set both of these arrays to zeros. Now when working with 2D arrays, it's often easier to work with two-dimensional coordinates. So I'm going to create a little lambda function here to uh, make it a little bit easier for me to access the array. And in this case, I want this lambda function to return the uh, value of the output array depending on my x and y coordinates. I'm using the screen width here to multiply by the y. And we're going to treat the onUserUpdate function as if it's a single epoch. So every time this function is called, we're going to do a full update of the entire array. But before we start to modify the state of the array, we need to store it in the output. So now we're free to interrogate the output and change the state of the cell. I'm going to use two nested for loops to iterate through all of the cells. And you'll notice I'm starting them from the coordinates 1, and I'm going to the screen width minus 1 and the screen height minus 1. I'm doing this to avoid reading memory which isn't there. There are actually several approaches in cellular automata about what to do with the boundaries. In this case, I'm just ignoring it. They're going to remain fixed. But some people do actually prefer to have them going periodic, so as the cell's activity goes off one side, it appears on the other. The first part of the algorithm said we need to count the number of cells in our immediate neighbourhood. Well, I can use the cell lambda function that I created before to help me with this. So it's just the current coordinate minus 1, and this is the northwesterly cell. Now because the value is either a 0 or 1, I can just keep adding these and count them as I go. So in this case I'm not moving along in the x-axis, so I'm going to put a plus 0 in here just to keep it consistent, but I'm still on the row above. And I do this for all of my neighbours. So here is the northwest, and here is the southeast. I then need to behave differently depending on whether the current cell is alive or dead. And we can do that by just checking the output. So if the current cell is alive, it's set to 1. Now if I'm alive and I have two or three neighbours, as said before, I'll remain alive, I'll carry on being alive. However, in any other condition, I'll die. So here I've got a little boolean check, and I'm kind of cheating, I'm forcing a boolean to be an integer value in this case. So if I've got two neighbours or three neighbours, I remain alive because that'll return true. Anything else will return false and kill the cell. If I'm not alive, then I only become alive if the number of neighbours is equal to three. Since we're iterating through all the cells in a nested for loop, I might as well take advantage of this opportunity to draw them. And to do this, all I'm going to do is again check whether the current cell is alive or not, and if it is, I'm going to draw a white character, and if it isn't, I'm going to draw a black character. And that's it. The highlighted code is all we need to implement Game of Life. Let's run it and see what happens. So we can see the console has popped up, but hang on, there's no life. Oh dear. Well, that's because we haven't got any starting cells. We initialised all of our memory to zero to begin with. Well, we need some cells to breed to produce a new cell. To test if the algorithm works or not, I'm going to go through each cell and set the state randomly to zero or one. Let's try again. 
Perfect, there we go, we can see life quite happily living. I'm going to add a little bit of input handling code here to check whether I'm holding down the space key, because I only want life to evolve if I'm holding the key down. This allows us to stop it and analyse it. So I hold the space down and let go, and we can see life stops. As people began to study the game of life, they realised that certain patterns exhibited certain behaviours. The Wikipedia article lists some of these, and I thought it would be fun to try and study them more closely. So instead of starting with a random state for all of the cells, I'm going to manually set the state of some of the cells. Now I could do this like so, where I manually uh, specify the coordinates of the cells and put them into the array. However, this will make it a bit tedious to enter the patterns. So I'm going to try something a bit more visual. As before, I'm going to create a little lambda function, except this time it's for setting the value of the cell. So again, it takes an x and a y coordinate, and it also takes a type string. The contents of this lambda function will iterate through the string character by character, and if the character is a hash, it specifies a 1 in that state location. Otherwise it's a 0. This leaves us now with a much nicer syntax for specifying starting shapes. Where I can visually see what the shape should look like to start with. Let's have a look. This is the arpentomino. I don't like the spacebar thing now, and instead I'm just going to slow the thread down with a weight. So from that starting point we can see it grow, and we can see we've got some spinners and some gliders. The gliders are the ones that travel a great distance. Let's try something a bit more interesting, the Gosper Glider Gun. This is an example of an automata producing something with a more usable output. Let's take a look. So here we can see there's some bouncing back and forth between two starting points, but it continuously emits gliders. Our little lifeforms have managed to create a sequence. And don't forget this really complicated behaviour is implemented with just two if statements. Mathematicians also found out that it's possible to have patterns which exhibit infinite growth. Let's have a look at this one. This one's all implemented in a single line. I like the symmetry of this one. Cellular automata on a sequential machine like my desktop PC can be quite demanding of the processor. So I'm going to set it back to just doing a random start. I'm going to set it to release mode. And I'm going to double the resolution of my console. But half the size of the font. And just let it run away. Cellular automata is an intriguing field of research, and I've only shown one very simple algorithm out of many, many hundreds. It's not just interesting to mathematicians and computer scientists, people are now searching for it in biology, and there is some evidence to suggest that cells in the body might also interact in this way. Whatever you might think, I think there is a definite beauty to the emergent behaviour from such a simple rule set. As usual, all the source code is going to be available on GitHub, and if you've enjoyed this video, give me a big thumbs up, uh, have a think about subscribing, and I'll see you next time.